Thank you, Nathan. So this morning I'm continuing the series of sermons that I've been giving on building a spiritual palace, which is really having a terrific relationship with God. And this morning I'm going to be talking about the subject of building a foundation, the foundation for the spiritual palace that we're going to be building. Uh, Before I get to that, though, I want to start by sharing a funny story. It is related to the sermon a little bit later on. How a, a man hired a contractor to remodel his bathroom. And the contractor did a terrific job. He got, it looked great, and he got done two days early. And so the man was so excited and so happy, he said to the contractor, look, I want to give you this little bit extra. Here's $150. I want you to take the missus out to dinner and the movie. The man thanked him, and later on that afternoon, about 6 o'clock, the doorbell rang. The man opened up the door, and there was a contractor standing there. He said, hey, what's up, man? Do you forget something? He said, no, I'm here to take the missus out to dinner like you asked. (laughs) That will come back in the sermon. I just want to assure you at some point. Now, uh, let's join together for a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, I thank you so much for the privilege and the responsibility of sharing your word with your congregation this morning. I pray, Lord, that all that is said, all that is sung, all that is heard this day in this place would be acceptable in your sight, for you are our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of Henry Nouwen. He was a a famous French priest and author, and he wrote something kind of interesting. He said this, let's dare to enter into an intimate relationship with God without fear, trusting that we will receive love and always more love. And a spiritual palace relationship with God is just that, an intimate relationship with God that we are in without fear and in which we experience love and more love. Now the subject that I'm going to be talking about today is preparing our hearts and minds to build this kind of relationship. The way we do that is we begin by taking a look at who we are as a person compared to where we feel God wants us to be. Now this is a very important subject. It's a subject the Bible tells us more than 20 times to examine our conscience, to look at who we are in comparison to where God wants us to be. And anything that that the Bible tells us 20 times that we ought to be doing, it's something very important that we ought to be paying attention to. Now, it's about this loving relationship with God. That's the reason why we do this. Um, The Apostle Paul reminds us that we can have the kind of close personal relationship with God that is very similar to what Christ had. And that's what uh, he was saying in the scripture passage that Pastor Nathan was just reading to you. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Now this is not a commandment, but it's an invitation. It's an invitation to have the best thing that life has to offer. And that is a deep personal relationship with the eternal creator of the entire universe. And this is what God offers to us. Now the great thing about this invitation, when we accept this invitation, when we agree to put our foot on the path towards building this terrific relationship with God, it not only strengthens and blesses us step by step along the way, but it also blesses the church. As each one of us is lifted up, all of us are strengthened. That's what the Apostle Paul also said when he said this, um, we should all come to the full measure of the full stature of Christ, from whom the whole body is joined and knit together by every ligament which is equipped. As each part working, is working properly, it promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. So as we do our part to become more like Christ, to, to have that terrific relationship with God, 
we strengthen the whole body of believers. And as the whole body of believers is strengthened, then we are encouraged to take more of those steps. So it's a positive uh, upward thing for all of us. In the last church that I served, which was St. Andrews in Brandon, I was uh, the staff liaison to the building committee, and that was a big assignment because that church had two building projects that they took on in the time that I was there, and they were both bigger, each one bigger than the uh, foundry construction project considerably. And uh, as the staff liaison to the building committee, we had a great and talented building committee, but I was the sort of the staff supervisor for what was going on, and so I would walk the construction site twice a day, once at lunchtime and once at the end of the day, see how the construction was going, notice if there were any things that were not uh, as they should be, and then if there was something that I needed to bring to the builder or to the architect. So I learned a tremendous amount about construction in that job. And the thing that surprised me the most about the building projects was how long the, uh, the foundation took to go into place. Uh, I don't, if you've ever planted a garden, you know, you dig up the soil, you get the soil ready, you put the seeds in the ground, and then it seems like you wait forever for the seeds to come up. And boy, it was the same way with the building project. You know, we finally got everything approved, everything's ready, all the money's in place, everything. The architects, everybody's hired. And then it seems to take forever. First, they have to survey the whole place. And then we've got everything carefully measured. Then the bulldozers arrive and they level the ground. They raise parts up, they lower parts down, they prepare the soil. They do a soil test to make sure that there's nothing hidden that's going to get in the way. Then they uh, dig the trenches and they put the rebar down and they put the conduit in and the pipes in. And finally, they're ready to pour the concrete. When they pour the concrete, my, man, what a pro uh, production. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but they bring cement mixer after cement mixer and they pour it into this thing and they have a huge... Uh, pipe that comes down, it's sort of like a giant straw, and the man walks around in the construction site with his giant pipe, and the concrete is just pouring out, and fills up that whole area uh, with cement. And then they have to wait for it to harden, and then once it's partly hardened, they go in and they smooth it all down. It takes three weeks from the time they begin the survey till the time the cement is ready for building to, to take place. Now, when that first happened, I was a little suspicious of why they were taking so long. I thought, you know, sometimes contractors will work on more than one project at once and just put two hours in your project today and two hours in the next guy's project and so on. But I found out that actually it's typical for a foundation to take that amount of time. Foundation work takes about 20% of the project and 20% of the materials. And so in the same way, when we go to build our spiritual foundation for God, it can take more time than what we expect, and it can require more of us than we can expect. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we begin by measuring ourselves, just like with the building of a big building. They go and measure the grounds, and they carefully lay out all the stakes to figure out where everything is. Well, we do the same thing. We measure ourselves. We take a look. It's in the Christian church, we call it a uh, conscience, an examination of conscience. If you're familiar with the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, they call it a fearless moral inventory. But uh, basically what it means is we take a look, a deep look into our heart, into our mind, and we ask ourselves, am I the person that God intended me to be? And if not, what am I doing that's preventing me from being that person. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us this, be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measure yourselves by the faith God has given us. And in his second letter to the Corinthians, he says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves to see if Christ is in you. If not, you've failed the test of genuine faith. And Jesus talked something about this in the Sermon on the Mount when he told us not to worry about taking the speck out of our neighbor's eye, our brother's eye, if we have a log in our own. 
And the message here is that he was giving us, the first message was, you know, don't judge other people. But the implied message, the second message is, if you've got a log in your eye, if you've got something that you're doing that is displeasing to God, you need to get rid of that log. You need to take it and put it aside. Now, these are just a couple of examples of, of more than 20 places in Scripture where we are reminded to examine ourselves, to look into ourselves. This is important because if we're going to change and be the person that God really wants us to be, well, then we have to know exactly where we are, exactly who we are. I'm going to do something I haven't done in a long time. I'm going to quote Yogi Berra twice in a, in a row. Two, I did last week and again this week, but uh, Yogi Berra said, you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. If we don't know where we are morally, uh, if we don't know where we are in terms of our motivation, if we don't know where we are in terms of our thinking, and our thought process, it's difficult for us to build a solid foundation of spirituality. Whatever we build on will be shaky at best. Now, our thoughts are very, very important. Our thought process. In the uh, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous 12 step, the fourth program, the fourth step is, you know, this fearless moral inventory. And what they suggest that we do in that is to write out our whole life story from beginning to end and try to identify where are we? What exactly caused us to be exactly where we are? Let, what are our sore points? What's happened to us? And the idea is that when you write that out, your thinking process is exposed because it's the thoughts that are important. Sometimes it is what we call stinking thinking that gets us, that holds us back. And it may be that you've got stinking thinking that internalized somewhere a long time ago in your past. And you don't even know that it's there, but it can be holding you back or leading you to behaviors that are not acceptable. You don't even remember what caused it. All that shows up is these things that are going on. Uh, and so it can be difficult. It can take a long time. It can take maybe even going to counseling to work through because our thoughts have to be right. And if they're not, they're going to hold us back. I can share a story with you. Uh, when I first went to become a pastor, I went up for my first interview with the Board of Ordained Ministry. I was still in divinity school at the time. And the Board of Ordained Ministry determined that I had a sort of a, uh, a blockage. And what they determined was that I had a problem relating to authority. Now you wouldn't think as a, uh, as a former Marine, I would have a problem relating to authority, but I did. And uh, what it was is not that I was rebellious, that, not that type of uh, uh, problem, but I was not assertive enough in the face of authority and it, I had to go to counseling. They sent me to, to go to counseling about it. And it turned out that uh, my dad, not my stepdad, who many of you know, but my dad was uh, uh, an alcoholic and was abusive when I was a kid. And the message that I learned as a kid was, keep your head down. And if somebody's, you know, seeming to be big or blustery or whatever, just avoid it, you know, get out of the way. And without even realizing it, I had internalized that message. It took me years to work through it and to get healed and whole again. And I just want to encourage you uh, so that, you know, when you go through this process, it can take some time. We can get discouraged. And so I want to remind you, you know, the scriptures tell us, Paul tells us, and this is very important to know, how much God loves us. Paul writes this, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. That's important for us to know because sometimes when we do one of these moral inventories, when we do an examination of conscience, when we really take time to look into our heart and into our mind, we may see things in there that we're not happy with. We may not like what we see. Or we may be discouraged because we keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again and we can't correct it. And it's helpful for us to know that God loves us as we are right now. God sees us as we could be and as he would like us to be, but he also sees us as we are and loves us just the way we are so we can cut ourselves some slack. 
Now you may be thinking, well, you know, maybe I'm too old to start out on a process like this, or maybe I'm too young to start out on a process like this. But let me ask you, how old was Moses when God called him through the burning bush? He's 80. How old was David when God called him to become king? He was a teenager. So we're never too young, we're never too old. Uh, God is inviting us to this really terrific relationship, wants us to receive this kind of relationship, and today is a great day to start, to decide we're going to put our foot on that path and walk in that way. So I mentioned more than 20 times the Bible tells us that we should do this. Here's what Paul says in his letter to the Galatians. You should each judge your own conduct. And he warns us, don't deceive yourselves. Don't deceive yourselves. That's why I picked the, uh, it's not up there on the screen, but the lion on your, uh, on your bulletin cover, the, the kitty who's looking into the mirror and sees the lion, sometimes we deceive ourselves. Sometimes we're lying to ourselves. Oh. <laughs> so, sometimes, you know, we're just wrong, like the uh, contractor who came to the door looking for a date. You know, we, we've uh, been barking up the wrong tree. But uh, I'm not trying to excuse anybody's bad behavior. I'm just trying to point out that when we prepare the ground, for the foundation for our spiritual palace, it can take some time, it can take some effort. But it certainly is worth it. Uh, and it is such a blessing when we, whatever step we take in building that spiritual palace, it's a blessing to us. So in the message today, we've heard that a spiritual palace relationship starts with preparing the ground by looking deeply and honestly into ourselves. So. On the back of your scripture notes and quotes sheet, uh, there is a examination of conscience. It's an exercise, you can follow the steps very easily. It takes about 20 minutes to do. Now, in building your spiritual palace, sometimes it's about taking away things that we're doing that we shouldn't do, and sometimes it's about adding things to our lives that we should be doing that we're not doing. An examination of conscience can help us to figure that out. And Lent is coming up. And Lent is a great time to take something on for God or to put something aside for God. So I want to ask you to take this spiritual inventory, this examination of conscience. Take some time this week. It takes about 20 minutes to go through. I want to ask you to, to go through it uh, and look and see if there's something that during the time of Lent you'll be able to take on for God or to give up for God. Will you do that? I see a few heads nodding. Yes, all right. That's what I want to hear. All right. Uh, so let's uh, confirm that intention with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, many times in your word, the scriptures, You've told us that it's important for us to examine our own motives, to examine our thoughts, to examine our actions, so that we can see whatever faults we have, whatever holds us back from being filled with love for you and for others, to enjoy life the way you want us to. We pray, Lord, that you would guide each one of us to find time in this week that we might look into our soul, into our spirit, into our emotions to ask where we are in comparison to where you want us to be and that you would guide us to, with resolve, to take action for you uh, during Lent, to take on something or to give something up that we might grow in our relationship with you. And all this we pray and thank you for in Jesus' name. Our closing hymn this morning is, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. It's number 402. We're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's stand and sing together.